Crude oil. Well, it took a turn upward in the last couple of days. What we have is we have them both up rising pretty steadily since the events uh, in the Middle East have occurred. And I think this uncertainty is going to continue. What does it mean for the overall economy? Anytime you raise the price of oil, we saw that starting in 1973 with the oil crisis, you hurt the consumer economy because it takes money from disposable income. And so this is not going to be a pretty sight for the economy, which is primarily a consumer one. It means that the stock market is a crazy place to be right now, unless you're trying to figure out how to short it. Gold, well, gold is its own thing. Oil seems smart. But in general, there is a business risk. The Fed just today said that they were going to raise interest rates even more to tame inflation. Not wise in my view. Mortgage rates are hitting 8%. Water, which has not been priced with the market, been priced out of the market because it's been a government monopoly, is a logical way to go. Hi, guys and gals. Such a pleasure. And we are just enjoying so many rapid advances. I will try and cover a lot of it tonight. Um, also, we're not going to go excessively long. We've tended to pack a lot of content in the past, and I would like to keep it to 45 minutes or less. So, and I think I think you'll agree that it's probably more, um, well, it allows more, more, fr more freewheeling time, which seems to be something that's very productive. All right. So here we go. Water, the blue gold, Thursday, November 2nd, 2023. Water is the people's asset. All right, the usual safe harbor statement and disclaimer for any discussion we have of investing. Drought in the Midwest, you've been hearing about that. There's, um, you know, yes, we're hearing that water is low, et cetera. And, but unfortunately for agriculture, it's not just water stress. Let's see what that means. Number one, on the left here, you see water levels in the Mississippi River plummeting, continuing to plummet, blistering heat, low rainfall, triggered extreme drought over across parts of the central U.S. And I'll bet you that the captain of that barge is having a stressful time getting up the Mississippi. But there's another story here about fertilizer and nutrient management. Now, drawing this to my attention is my main man, Tom Marchesello. And so he's going to report it in full next week. He's the COO. Uh, he's also going to give an update on progressive water treatment, which is his specific project at this time. So uh, stay tuned for next week because that's what it's going to be all about. Now, investment themes, investment themes of the 2020s. Um, well, uh, this comes from Visual Capitalist and they uh, spotlighted the investment themes since 1950. Let's take a look at these. 1950s, European stocks, and that was... For some reason, European stocks were important. Looks like the UK and France were doing well. 1960s, uh, something called the Nifty 50. If you were a holder in these big consumer brands that were just taking off post-World War II into the 60s, you did very well. 1970s, of course, we saw oil skyrocket 10x. That I was there. It was ridiculous. And it resulted in a lot of contraction because as I mentioned earlier, um, when the price of oil rises, then it takes money away from the consumer wallet. Uh, in the 80s, uh, Japanese stocks were hot. Wow. 41% of all global equities were Tokyo. Crazy. Of course, that crashed. 1990s, I was part of that uh, dot-com boom uh, where it just took off on and on and on until year 2000. And that became... Really, um, after the, the recovery from the year 2000, we moved into the um, the big high techs like Facebook and so forth. Uh, year 2000s, emerging markets, commodities, bricks and oil prices uh, continue to be an issue. I remember trying to build a an algae company at the time, and everything was fine. Um, and oil prices got rather high, but then they crashed in the later part. You can see how they crashed in the later part of the decade. And finally, the uh, mega caps, you know, Facebook, Apple, Google, NVIDIA, and there's one other A. Um, I have to remember what that one is. But let's take a look at the 2020s. What is coming in the 2020s? So let's take a look at that. So... Right now, we have a situation where cash is inflating, inflating fast. Why? Because lots of cash is being issued and um, wages aren't keeping up and the dollar is, and many, many other currencies are losing value. 
But commodities are trending. Why? Because we're moving from a currency-based finance system to a commodity-based finance system. Now, this is bullish for all commodities. But as I've been saying, water is just emerging from government monopoly, potentially leading to what I like to call a water rush. And Gene Tully helped me out. That second A was Amazon. Thank you, Gene. Uh, I should have known because I was <laughs> I was at Amazon long ago and sold it before it actually made money. Um, but the key to the water rush is you got to create an investable asset. You can't, yeah, okay, invest in municipal bonds. That's fine. It's uh, slow money and it doesn't keep up with inflation. Uh, you can buy uh, stock in a water company, uh, but water companies tend to have low margins. So why not invest directly in the water asset? And that's what we've created, of course, with water on demand. Okay. Now, Peter St. Tillage is always very good at discussing what's going on. So I thought I would play his uh, short video on where he thinks things are going. All right, let's take a look. One of the more sobering thoughts at the moment is that as bad as things are in Joe Biden's stagflation miracle, we haven't even hit the full recession yet. When we do on present trends, we could come out the other end with a Japan style zombie economy, one dominated by lobbyists and activists. That's because the modern recession playbook is pretty much set in stone, a set of suicidal policies that make the recovery as slow and as feeble as possible while transferring the maximum amount of resources from the people to the federal black hole. The standard recession story goes like this. When central banks crash the economy, it sends unemployment and bankruptcy soaring, filling food kitchens across America. That leads to deafening calls for federal action. Because when the pain is bad enough, the people beg to be controlled. Above all, they say, do something. And ever since the Great Depression, do something has meant two things. One, cut interest rates to zero. And two, expand federal spending as much as humanly possible. The problem is both of these are exactly the wrong thing to do. They stop the recovery in its tracks and they permanently shift us towards a zombie economy. We never actually recover. Now, this is exactly what happened in 2008, years of stagflation that lasted until Trump. To see why, consider why the recession is happening in the first place. Because money was too cheap for too long, which funded a bunch of crappy businesses called malinvestments. When the Fed raised rates, those malinvestments started liquidating. Money was too expensive. When that happens in a cluster, we call it a recession. At which point, the correct thing to do is to accelerate the liquidation to free up resources for the next generation of healthy companies. That means the federal playbook of free money actually stops the recovery. It throws a lifeline to the malinvestments and their billionaire founders, letting them keep hogging trillions of resources and millions of workers courtesy of cheap loans. Of course, it gets worse because the federal government piles in to the tune of another couple trillion in spending. That hogs yet more resources, for example, steel and construction workers, shanghaied into rebuilding racist overpasses instead of, say, a machine tool factory in Wisconsin. So on the surface, it looks great. The construction workers are being paid either way. The steel is being used. But the recovery itself was stopped. The zombies are marching while the next generation of firms, the ones who should be building the recovery, are starved of resources. It's exactly what happened in Japan these past 30 years, essentially running the recession playbook all the time, with sky-high government spending paired with sky-low interest rates, delivering decades of zombie economy while racking up public debt equivalent to $60 trillion in U.S. terms. So what's next? Brought to you by Unchained. What's next is, believe it or not, there was a time when governments actually fixed recessions by cutting federal spending and either holding interest rates steady or even raising them to accelerate the liquidation of malinvestments. Jim Grant wrote a fantastic book on the last time we did it right, 1921, called The Forgotten Depression, and I walk through some of that history in this week's article. Alas, the modern recession playbook is exactly the wrong thing to do because it does exactly what Washington wants. It expands Leviathan puts even more of the economy in Washington's pocket, it gives them even more control over our lives, and it scares voters enough to do what they are told. Read the rest of the article at ProfSanange.com. Okay, we'll be watching. See you next time. Before I, I play this excellent uh, interview with Eric Moldenhauer, I just wanted to say that 
it's obvious that we're not going to get some enlightened handling of a recession. We're going to have exactly what happened in 2008, because that's what Washington does. They never fail by doing what was done before. That's They keep their jobs and the money flows into Washington, D.C. like crazy. So lots of government spending on the wrong kind of stuff. Remember, water never gets proper uh, funding at the municipal level. It's always, always starved for some crazy reason, probably because, I don't know, not enough lobbyists in water. I don't know why. But the other factor is this idea of interest rates, which I personally would like interest rates to go back down because I do not like my HELOC right now. Uh, but that's a secondary consideration. At this point, interest rates are going to go down. So making money off of bonds is going to go away and uh, government spending will go up. So what is the, the investor to do? Well, again, asset-based investments to me seems to be the way to go. All right. With that, we're going to continue and listen to what our good friend, Eric Moldenhauer has to say. Here we go. All right. Well, here we are uh, in December 2022. And I guess you first in invested, what, about six months ago? Something like that? Yeah. Yeah. It was about six months ago. Um, that was the first investment. And then uh, I kind of been keeping in touch with Ken and, um, you know, just kind of getting some more information. And then the another investment about uh, maybe two months ago, maybe a month ago. I don't know. I always track of time easily. And, uh, and then we got this most recent one. So I just got the, the signed document and you're ready to make that that next investment. So, yeah. Yes. Well, it's amazing that, you know, we, we, we know this, that, that you know, investors tend to reinvest because, um, well, once they're in Ken's hands, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> He's a good salesman. Hey. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, what I like about Ken is that, you know, he, he addresses it from a, you know, a real pragmatic business point of view. He's a investor like you and me, you know, he understands what's going on out there, how few opportunities we do have these days. I, I, I sold, I was in, I was in a, an ETF, um, all and gas ETF and I bailed. I was like, this, this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't yeah. predict. It's not so much that it's going down or up. It's I can't predict it. It's like, yeah. The I yeah, things used to be a little more predictable before, you know, cycles, and now it's just a, uh, it's just random chaos, <laughs> basically, and very geopolitical. So, you know, if you have an insight yes. on, on Nancy, uh, <clears throat> Nancy Pelosi's trading account, you're in good shape. Otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, and since I'm not, yeah, <laughs> right. But um, so, what? What? When you first. I, I think you responded to a an, uh, one of our offerings through Manhattan Street Capital. What first um, attracted you to the idea of Origin Clear? Uh, so the first thing that I I just kind of noticed is uh, you know I, it was actually you that was on the little uh, you know the ad that I saw, and I just thought yeah that looks interesting. Like you know I I looked at water stocks in the past, and uh, you know just didn't really see anything that really sparked my interest was kind of like, yeah, okay. Yeah. It's just another stock. Um, but this just looked like it offered something different. So I wanted to research a little bit more. So I started looking into it and seeing, you know, like, how is this different from, you know, the, the big water companies that are out there. And, and basically what I found is that, well, you're not the water company. Right. <laughs> you're the one trying to fix the water companies. And I was like, Hmm, that's probably a great idea because you know, I, I tend to watch some of these uh, documentaries about, you know, water supply and this and, you know, how our water's polluted and, you know, the uh, quote uh, truth about, um, you know, how our water get, gets polluted. And I was like, mm, I think this company has got something here. So um, that was my initial reason for looking into um, Origin Clear. Wow. Well, um, yes. And, and, you know, what's interesting is that we're constantly refining the vision, as you know. We're, we're uh, most recent developments, which at the time of this recording, we can't really discuss um, where things might be going. But right. it, we we keep like going, oh wow, you know, like um, almost like uh, broken field running, right? Oh, there's a hole, boom, 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 right? And um, I, I think that it's just a matter of being willing to constantly reinvent. Like, no, you know, don't get complacent. Like, well, we we. 
we got the billion year billion dollar contract. We're good now for a couple of years. You know, uh, right. first of all, I'll have billion year, billion dollar contracts. <laughs> <laughs> but it, so we're it, it's it makes sense that as an interloper, we would question the way things are and then um, try to find you know what moves the needle, so to speak. So. Let, let me ask you, just as a general allocation, how are you invested in general, just as percentages of what to what? Not just over- um, Yeah, so I would say I probably have uh, right now, I'm probably about 40 to 50% um, asset classes, um, you know, so Origin Clear, um, some, uh, um, I don't want to say strip mall investments, but basically like, um, like grocery centered um, investments, so somewhat real estate. Um, probably about 30% or so, um, my own personal IRA, and then a lot of some in like stocks and, you know, little things here and there. So, um, but I tend to, I think over the last couple of years, especially I've gone from, well, I have my, my IRA, which is good because I do need that. Um, I'm hopeful, you know, years from now, it'll look a little better than it does now. Like most people, um, <laughs> but I think with the asset class, um, there's the, I think that's the biggest opportunity and that's really where I've turned my focus in the last couple of years, because, you know, it's, it's not just, you know, it's not like, Hey, let's, let's invest in the startup company. Like you guys have been around and other ones that I've invested in. Like I, I see what their vision is. And I think if, as an investor, if you see that vision and you agree with it, then that's what you should invest in. You know, it shouldn't just be, uh, yeah, I heard this might be pretty good. So I'll just throw some money into it. Like, you have to believe in their vision as well. So, yeah. Plus, the stuff you hear has been fed into the media, you know, ecosystem. Oh, I somehow heard it. Yeah, that was actually planted by a good PR agency, right? Right, so, right. Um, but yeah, I mean, one of the things is that yeah, we've been doing this for a long time, probably too long. But by the same token, you're right that that we've got a tremendous amount of perspective. We have an idea of what not to do. And uh, which I think, you know, it, it reduces risk. We're, we're less likely to do something stupid. Like, for example, early on, we used to, uh, we used to, we used to go in California, we used to go after all these grants. Well, if you don't have a good lobbyist in Sacramento, good luck, right? right. So, so these, but the problem is these big grants, $5 million, $10 million, they would take all the air out of the room. And it's all people would obsess with. I'm like, I finally had to ban these things because, you know, everybody would, I make that their holy grail. And so we learned that um, to to just not go after these, you know, home runs because they tend to, you know, lose, um, really lose the, the focus. The other thing we learned, of course, and is that I think the best, most precious asset you have is your long-term investors, right? And uh, one of the things that we did that was very productive in um, 2018 going into 2019 in it, we were very innovative in finding ways. Most most startups, you know, they go through all this dilution and the ski slope stock price, and the early investors get crammed. It's very painful, and so we figured out an innovative way, which wonder of wonders, legal signed off on, to basically you know hit rewind, and if people would commit to more, then we would we would rescue their original investment and then protect the whole thing the way your investments. Uh, relatively protected, meaning that it converts at a later price, whatever that price is. Right. So that just, you know, people loved us, but they were also like, oh my gosh, what's going on here? They felt very disappointed. Today, we have, I think, a very strong base of, of you know, really well investors who were like, okay, you know, um, we're going to be good. This Obviously, it's going to be, how, it's going to take however long it takes, but we're going to be good. And um, probably that's the thing I'm most proud of because I, I, regardless of whether it was quote unquote legal to, to dilute everybody and, you know, hurt them in the end, it, it wasn't really very moral. Right. 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 Yeah. Well, you know, and it's, I mean, it's, I think people have gotten so used to um, especially in the last couple of years, kind of these fast, you know, fast moving, you know, like you're going to make a million dollars because you had the you had the the market going crazy. You had all the crypto going crazy. I mean, I, I know when I was because I do have my own personal stocks and, you know, I've also fallen into that, you know. Um, yeah, there, I, 
I'm, I'm invested in this startup and now it's three years in and I was like, okay, it's, it's apparently still starting. Um, but I also understand the market conditions are a big factor, but you know, like you look at the beginning of 2021 and the market was going crazy and everybody's like, holy cow, we're, you know, everybody's going to be rich. And, and then you weren't <laughs> because everything just, you know, it's like you went up to the top of the ski slope and now you're at the bottom of it or, or you're still or you're at the, in the air right now, wondering where you're going to land. <laughs> Um, which is, I think, most people. Um, so yeah, I mean, you have to you have to look at those long term investments, and you know that's that's typically how I think investing used to be, and mm -hmm. then we got away from that, you know, because that's how I was. Like I started putting into my my four hundred one k with my first quote real job when I was twenty two, twenty three years old, and I always kept it in there from the from the very first day. And it's like, yeah, you look and it fluctuates, but over time you see it keep going up, going up, you know. Whereas the last couple of years, everybody's like, oh, we should be making more. We should like, no, you have to, you have to give time for these things to work themselves out. That's how real life works <laughs> and companies work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, how many flashes in Japan have we seen, right? It's crazy. And it is, you know, it's completely a hype world. Um, I, I'm very interested by how, how I'm always fascinated by how we're manipulated by the media. And by the way, mainstream media and alternative media, both. They're both, everybody's got an agenda, right? And so you've got to stick with the basics. And uh, I'm uh, Eric, I'm really proud and thankful that you've come on board. And yeah. you're, uh, you're not only invested once, but twice, possibly a third time. And uh, uh, I can tell you that that is, um, there's nothing makes me feel better than to know we have that kind of support. So Eric, I yeah, want to absolutely. thank you. Yeah, He's thank you. No, that's that's great. I'm I'm glad to be aboard. So yeah, I'm. You know, I was thrilled when uh, I got the chance to talk to Ken, and you know, he was like a, the thing that I think really kind of, you know, also wanted me to get into this was just you know his his vast amount of knowledge, and like you said, he can he can really present in a you know down to earth way that everybody understands it, and really kind of yeah. dig into some of those details and. You know, sometimes you get into investment, and you think, okay, yeah, I know your profits are supposed to be this, but I mean, you can really talk to the product and the vision and everything. And that's, I really appreciate that because I know that that's an asset in itself to, you know, to have him on board. So, no, he's, he's um, probably, you know, the first among equals. He's, he's of all the people that, that I work with here in the company, he's, he's super key and extremely valuable. And, um, well, of course, he'll hear this and blush, but <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. I'll let him. I'll let him stay with the company for a couple more months. Yeah, yeah, I think he's doing all right. So, yeah. Plus, you need someone else to join you at the end of those, uh, you know, those briefings for the final five minutes. So, <laughs> a freestyle interview. Yeah, a freestyle. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, thank you very much again, and I wish you very happy holidays, and let's have a wonderful 2023 together. Yeah, same to you. Thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. And uh, yeah, I look forward to great things. Thank you, Eric. That was really cool. Um, of course, Eric is, is a gem, one of our many uh, amazing investors. It's interesting that we had that interview just about when we were starting this whole adventure of uh, the merger because we first got recommended it in November. And then I think it was January when we first announced um, that we had uh, taken over the sponsorship of the SPAC. And then, then the rest is history. Uh, it's an interesting process because what people don't realize is that we essentially we bought out the promoters of the SPAC, a SPAC special purpose acquisition corporation. That's a blank check company. So we, we bought out the um, promoters sponsors they're called. These are people who do not put money in the SPAC, but they get a percentage, in this case, 23.5% of the SPAC for their efforts in finding a target to acquire. Well, they hadn't found a need, they'd gotten to the end and they were happy to receive a relatively small amount of money. Uh, I think it was $400,000 to leave and give us that 23.5%, which is no longer the same percentage today that, that, that has changed. But the point I'm making is this then gave us the, um, the, the role of proposing a target. And in this case, the target was us, was, was our own startup water on demand. 
which of course created a lot of like, well, we got to make sure this is not some kind of, you know, insider thing and the self-dealing and all that. But of course we passed all of those uh, concerns and um, a fairness opinion came out that on the Monday prior to the merger that basically gave uh, the, uh, the board of uh, Fortune Rising the confidence to go ahead with the merger agreement. That fairness opinion uh, will be part of the registration statement. Uh, it was called an S-4, which we hope to file in the next few weeks. And that is where the whole merger goes to the SEC for review and then takes two to four months. And during that time, we also do a an application to the NASDAQ. So hopefully it all ends up kind of at the same time and we have an effective merger. So that's kind of the timeline. But I just want to tell you a little bit about how this whole thing started uh, based on this sort of like taking over, essentially taking over a piece of the SPAC and the the the, the piece that actually has the job of proposing a, a merger target and then openly proposing our own water on demand as the acquisition target. Very interesting stuff. And it's been a pretty successful strategy because the whole SPAC world, you know, there's still 500 SPACs out there. That it's way too many, way too many of them. Uh, so this has been a good strategy in the end times of SPACs to help um, these, these SPACs find targets in the end. And we're grateful to the gentleman who brought us that, who pr would probably refer, refer to say below the radar, but he's a wonderful attorney. All right. Well, what's Origin Clear sharing all this? Let's take a look at this. This is how it ended up as disclosed in the, you can find all this in the, the 8K. And 8K is a, is a regulatory filing. And um, the, the business combination agreement has all this disclosed, but not in this one single handy table. So here's how it ended up. Basically, Water Demand Inc. is all common stockholders. Everybody got turned into common stockholders. No preferred shares, no nothing, right? except for the restricted stock grants, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so Origin Clear ended up being the, still the majority holder, almost 40, 54% of the total. The Regulation A shares, the crowdfunding shares, ended up relatively small because, of course, not much was invested. It was not a very big offering because we cut it short back in April because of what was happening with this. Um, then Series A and B, these are grants of stock that were made, Series A related to our water as an asset investment called the Series Y. And then Series B relates to some notes we issued. Um, There's free grants of stock. And as you can see, those investors did well because these were free shares that they received for their efforts and they still can. Finally, um, let me just jump to the convertible notes. These are investors who invested in the in Water On Demand Inc. and these notes convert just before the eventual date of the merger effective date, right? So they turn into shares in the post-merger company. Of course, if the merger fails, their shares in Origin Clear, that's already allowed for in the in the uh, in the structure of it. But at this point, uh, we uh, are. Uh, let's see, cautiously optimistic about how things are going. All right, so the convertible notes basically allowed people to buy that future stock at a discount, and um, they are uh, almost 30% of the total, which they have really um, earned because they helped us tremendously. Okay, restricted stock grants, what are those? Well, these are the grants. We have a philosophy. Some companies only give sweat equity, as it's called, that's that's shares that you don't pay for, quote unquote, but you pay for with your sweat. And um, most of us don't have bonus plans. We just have the stock. Um, and we are given these grants that can be taken away from us anytime if we, if we leave the company. But then they vest upon certain occurrences. In this case, um, the vesting for these grants is upon, among other, there's a number of possible events, but one of them is being listed on a national exchange, such as the NASDAQ. So these will eventually become tradable. Now, our philosophy is to not just give these to top execs, which is often what's done. Um, I love the story of Microsoft um, when 
the Microsoft went public and they literally had 2,400 millionaires made that day. Some of them were secretaries. I love that story. So what we've done is uh, we've always given stock grants to everybody all the time. That's been our policy all along. Obviously, they vary according to how uh, critical that person is to the company, um, but that's how we like to do it. The percentage, 11.41% is well within uh, expected percentages for equity grants, which is typically 10 to 15%. Let, let me uh, address some of the questions here. First of all, Paul Calra says, are all convertible notes holders outsiders? Well, let's put it this way. They're all accredited investors. They are not professional money. We specifically did not want we could have. We could have gotten a lot of, of Wall Street money and funded things that, that way. But unfortunately, we found many, many times over the years that these are very toxic, right? So these notes are held by existing investors, people who've been with us for a long, long time. So um, they're not insiders in a sense. They're not employees or directors or whatever, right? But they are um, closely associated with us and they are accredited investors. So that answers that question. Um, are the shares of original investors non-diluting? At this point, everything is common stock, meaning there's no anti-dilution provision. There were anti-dilution provisions, which, for example, Series A and B had anti-dilutive um, properties, which we then incentivize those holders to convert to common, exit the anti-dilution, and return for some benefits. So that's how that was handled. Mohammed Sadiq, my friend, how are you? Um, uh, Ken has already volunteered to talk to you privately, but Ken will be happy to get into it and I'll be happy to be part of it as well. Okay, so those are the questions relating to this and uh, I hope I've been as helpful as possible. Uh, when the S4 comes out, I'll be able to go over that fairness opinion. That's gonna be very, very interesting. So stay tuned for that. Okay, now the freewheeling discussion. You and I having a conversation earlier today really excited me about you know kind of kind of where we are and 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 the faith of our I mean people like Eric and by the way I enjoy the hell out of talking to Eric and Eric and I, I mean, we just you know we talk about the investment for about two minutes and he's like yeah 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 and then we spend like an hour we have a lot of we have a lot of common interests he and I so uh he's 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 real estate among them what real, real estate, estate among, among them. them yes yes um and he's um but he's also, Eric is kind of like, he was an early canary in the coal mine about alternative investing. Like he's really never been big on the 401k thing. He's like, yeah, that's, that's not, you know, that's not going to work. Um, so he's, he's, you know, he's been very active and a lot of stuff. And look, he's had some of the experiences that you and I have had the joy of sharing, like, you know, crypto and things like that. <laughs> And it worked out just as well for him, you know. Working with Russians, it always, it always works out great. Having, having the Russians just take your money. That is mine now. I keep hearing, and, and this is from, and again, I, 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 I'm places like Rumble and Getter, and, you know, there's a lot of ads that run, and a lot of these contrarian um, kind of alternative investment guys have been saying, look, um, we're going to see a 30% market correction. You know, kind of the shenanigans, the financial shenanigans that um, the Fed and other guys have been engaging in, you know, those chickens have to come home to roost at some point. Now, I don't know if it's going to be 30 percent. I do know that I'm in cash at this point and to the extent that I'm in cash and, and otherwise uh, in real estate. And it's because primarily real estate is that store of wealth similar to gold. Um, I'm leveraging 20, 23 dollars. Right. Uh, you know, I know that whatever dollars I'm paying now in 2023 mortgages won't won't be uh, won't be much in 2035. That sort of thing. You know, so if you like gold, you like real estate and real estate has an opportunity to kind of, you know, pay for itself, which is which is yeah, but there's a crazy issue going on right now in Florida. Flood insurance is going catastrophic. They just sent me a note. They just sent me a letter. They said, yeah, we put in, we put additional flood insurance at $700. I'm like, oh, in Miami, it's as high as $120,000 per year per house. Uh, amazing. If you're like right down there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, our condo um, complex, which is about 85 units, absorbed, um, it was an $85,000 
premium on top of existing this year. Um, fortunately, it was distributed For out. For the whole building, though. Yeah, exactly. So That's not terrible. No. That's not terrible. We were comparable. I mean, we have a couple of hundred units in my in my condos or on the on the golf course. And, but I'm on what, what is that? that that's um Largo Largo Inlet. Oh, you are by the water. I'm on Largo Inlet. Yeah. Yeah. So they they hit me and but they just sent me a letter. No, this is it. This is your new insurance. By the way, we paid it for you. Yeah. And <laughs> you know, send the money. I'm like, okay. These guys sent the letter. Um this is a photo. This is what the place looks like that we, we like it. I was showing AJ today. Some of my video um, interviews were from your balcony <laughs> from, from, from when we had the couch summit. The couch summit was crazy. So here you see um, from looking from the beach uh, eastward. And this is a romantic view oh, looking yeah. westward. And that's um, that end unit. That's that last. Yeah. Well, you know, who has it is Ted McGrath, but anyway, um, here the i'm in the cigarette and i are in the, the nearest unit bottom left so kind of i don't know if your my mouth shows it but right there yeah. um and so it's we have an intimate view of the marina we like it we like it very but much but it's high yeah. enough that if the water gets high you're not worried about it well there's an entire floor under the first floor which is the garage of course right anyway uh enough enough fiddle faddle enough fiddle faddle look suffice to say that we are um you and well, you and I, and then AJ more recently, we kind of got the um, chickens coming home to roost concept of what um, all of the financial, I mean, financial institutions, the government, the Fed, it's all, sh you know, there's a lot of people that feel this is, this is a shell game. So securing your, uh, your wealth, securing future wealth with you know, any asset. And you notice, we know that you know, like, there's no, there's no, um, there's no prejudice here. Gold, real estate. Um, well, no, I have a I have a bias against crypto, so I won't I won't include that. Uh, but gold, real estate. Um, but truthfully, the, the 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 first time monetization of water, I believe, has the widest possible um, appeal. Uh, for for all of the for all of the reasons you know we hear these excited chats that we we're getting these wonderful chats right AJ oh yeah um, and a couple of these folks are super excited because they get it right? right the ability to and and Riggs talked about it we're democratizing early positioning uh, we're democratizing early positioning mm -hmm. in water as an asset um, right now if you are a VC you get to invest in the decentralized corporatization, you know, co corporate use for water, which I think is is the new trend. But it literally will be unless you're a VC with 400, 500, 800 million dollars to play with. You don't you don't you don't have access. The ability to bring this to, I say, guys like me, guys who who um, have just as much concern about long term wealth planning but don't, not access to these deals. I think that this was probably, um, I don't know if it was born out of some flash of inspiration or if it was just, I was thinking like, I want to do something for a guy like me, right? You know, I don't know which one it was, but it worked out great. And and our supporters and our investors have just been phenomenal. And I couldn't be more happy with where we are. I believe one of your friends, uh, I won't say his name, and I think he sits on one of the boards, says, I'll probably, they'll probably be talking about this at Harvard Business School. Five years, yeah. On, five years from now on how you guys did this. Crazy, yeah, right? was, and I was like, wow, okay. You know, that, that would be exciting. Here is the uh, picture of the common thing that happens. Uh, Airbnb, for example, had early funding rounds. Sure. And look at good old uh, Ashton Kutcher, who made $157,000 a percent. Percent, his, percent, yeah, right? yeah. So- um, yeah, if you're Ashton Kutcher and you got an in on that stuff, great. But we don't think that's great. And here's the interesting part: I was uh, AJ and I were talking with a, a PR agency that we're we're talking about bringing on, and we were discussing the fact that what we really are doing is Origin Clear and Water Demand. We are the alternative funding route, symbolized by other people. For example, Buildable was a great example, right? Boxable. Or Night, Night Scope with a K. Those guys, Boxable, rather. I'm sorry. Um, what 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 they did is they did they raised their money outside of the VC 
uh, rounds. They didn't do really, A through G, right? Really effective. Yeah. And so they were not in that in that in that VC prison, which is kind of going sideways right now. And so this is the new new thing is to let everyday investors participate, and it's it's a pretty good model. The appetite and Riggs, the appetite is phenomenal. And not only that, these are for the most part fairly sophisticated people. People who watched a handful of guys become billionaires like Ashton Kutcher. I mean, look, you want to say he's the goofy guy from that 70s show. Great. He's also a billionaire, right? Uh, from that investment in Airbnb early on. And and, um, and others. I mean, he's he's been in the loop for some time. Uh, but I just wanted to, to kind of share that um, as the total difference here. Yeah. We are about retail fundraising. Yes. That's what we're about. And now that Water on Demand is moving on and hopefully gets ends up being merged, Origin Clear will go back to doing more of the same, helping That's companies true. get their funding yeah. to retail uh, investors. Now, right. I wanted to go back to this um, uh, chart because there's something I wanted to just say a little bit about the natural question people have. Let's take a look at this. Now, currently, Origin Clear is 54%. Run it off. Now, that's before the merger. Now, the problem with knowing what percentage we'll have post-merger is because we don't know. Currently, there's $40 million in, in the, um, the SPAC, but that is expected to go down. It's standard. It will happen. The question is, we don't know how much. And so it could be... A, but if it doesn't go down a lot, fine. Then there's a lot of money left and we're great. If it does go down a lot, then we have more shares of the NASDAQ company. Right. But here's what, what I wanted to say. The value to origin clear of this holding is in what's called consolidation. Let's say that down the road, just to keep things simple, we have 50% of the post-merger company. It'll be less than that, but it'll still be, I think, well north of 35%. So somewhere between 30 to 50% will end up owning of the merger. But let's just say for, because I'm not a mathematician, we'll say 50%, all right? That means that if um, What On Demand Inc. makes a million dollars, Origin Clear can book half of that as revenue of its own through consolidation, right? So that is the beauty of it, is that there's a direct relationship between the, the, the profits of the a uh, company that we're invested in, that we created, and our own well-being. So it is- it, it Also, is, the assets on the balance sheet. A hundred percent. Not to understate that. Exactly. Now, currently, Origin Clear is sub one, one penny. And the NASDAQ company, let's say, arbitrarily is $10. I'm, I have no idea what it will be. Well, at some point, that penny is going to come awfully closer to that $10 by virtue of owning- 30 to 50% so, so of, it, of right? the NASDAQ company, yep. it will average in, right? So uh, it doesn't take a lot for a penny stock to double. Yeah, goes to two cents, right? So there's tremendous upside potential, in my opinion, with Origin Clear because it will reflect a much higher stock price of its major holding. The market is always going to seek a vacuum, right? That's the vacuum. Right. There's a there's a disparity. Right. There's an arbitrage. It's, 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 it's the math. Something. It's even simpler than that. It's the math of it. Right. We have X percent of a company. Therefore, we that portion that we own is worth, let's say, ten dollars a share. Right. Boom. So therefore, we have that benefit on our balance sheet. Mm -hmm. And that's and so there's a very direct relationship, and this is why it's so powerful that we are going to continue to be the, uh, in my opinion, the largest holder for a very long time of the post-merger company should the merger occur. Okay, so I just wanted to emphasize that that Origin Clear is a good situation and it has a future. All right. So having said all that, I'm just going to go back to to our slides here. What got Ken so excited? is going to get you excited. And I can't say more than that. And so please go ahead. And um, if you're, if you're curious, can just my let you know what's going on. Uh, Josh will says AJ is very chatty tonight. Yes. Well, Listen, I, I have moments. Okay. And you guys are talking about very important things from, from a marketing perspective. We've been killing it lately. We've got people really, really coming in from, from all kinds of angles right now to try and talk to Ken. 
and and I, I mean that we're we're talking. Well, geez, it was like almost almost uh, almost three hundred new leads within like with less than a week. Right? This is important so, because this massive. is these this is in, uh, people coming in to invest in the water asset, Correct. which water on demand needs. Now it's being raised on the origin clear side, sure, right? and then water on demand in the future will be able to tap into it for a small um, carry carry fee. But basically, we're accumulating a fund that water on demand will be able to tap into. Okay. And the reason why we're doing it on the Ocean Clear side is because we're able to include a grant of the public company shares, which Water on Demand would not be able to do. Okay. And it was an existing offer anyway, right? It was open. Right. right. So that it's, it's the one that we can keep doing. Okay. Quickly now, I just want to deal with some comments. James Wright, the long lost Tus- Tuscadero brothers. Thank you. That That's very appropriate for Ken. Um, and... Uh, I know that the Japanese mafia is called Yakuza. I don't know what the Russians are. I don't know. Um, AJ zero tie, LOL. Oh, no tie. Well, none of us have ties. Okay. I I didn't get that. Um, Marcus, you're going to have to clarify that. And (laughs) water woman tells us to get out of Florida because it's going to sink. Thank you very much. Marcus Walker. Thank you guys for this opportunity. We, we thank you for having uh, believed in us. Ron Williams wants to introduce us to someone who's creating something amazing. Uh, send it to invest at originclear.com. That'll, that'll be fine. And then Keith, just happy about the excitement of the three of you, the dream team. Future is so bright. Um, gotta wear you, shades. Gotta wear shades. Riggs, when the party's, when, when, when the part, when's the party at your condo? Ooh, yeah, baby. Okay. Um, and then again, um, Ron says, I continue to buy OCL in a little at a time. Very smart. Accumulation is where it's at, my opinion. And again, James says, so that means I should keep holding on to the OCL and shares I have through my trading platform. Well, I, of course, never make recommendations, but I'm holding my shares. Let's put it that way. Um, oh, yeah, Marcus, last week he was to have a tie. That was the joke. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, we're getting there. Last week was the big announcement. So, again, for those of you that didn't hear, so I've officially been brought on as VP Marketing. We got lots of really good stuff cooking. Uh, lots of good stuff in the oven that's coming. So again, I I don't mean to be the hype guy at this point, but I feel like that's all I'm good for this evening with all of, all of the good info coming out of Riggs and Ken. But please, 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 please. Uh, oh, please be the hype guy. guy. The I, marketing you know. reports. The marketing, <laughs> marketing report. report. No, legitimately though, yeah. there's we we talk about this and and yes, it's a there's certainly all kinds of different tactics that that we use, but we're not kidding when we say like this this opportunity is not going to be around forever. Right there's there's only so long you get to be a founding investor in an opportunity like this, and you need seriously to talk to Ken and and look at your portfolio and see what makes sense for you and get in touch with Ken in, immediately. Now, there's there's only that so much I, that you can do. AJ uh, and or, I discussed. So much time. I'm sorry, AJ and I discussed this today at sitting in my office while he was again fixing my computer, um, and it's a look. Founding investors often have to wait years. To, to see the kind of the fruit of their vision. And some have. And some, ha- and some have. <laughs> but here's my, here's my point. If you're looking at us for the first time today, we're not talking years. We're not even talking really quarters, right? Um, if we're able to get this through the process, we're, we're talking, you know, weeks, months. Um, and that's, I mean, that's kind of the best of both worlds. Conservatively, and- it's two quarters. What? Conservatively, it's two quarters. Yeah, right. But that's months. Right. That's not years, right? Um, you know, some some folks, uh, the early investors in uh, Airbnb waited, what, 11 years? I think it was 11 years. So. Emil George, how much time is left to invest? Um, for credit investors, I've been out of the loop for five months. Definitely, uh, we will go ahead and give us your info in the Zoom survey, Emil, uh, that automatically comes up. Please uh, fill it out. Wyman says, thank you. For the oh, answer. non-accredited, non-accredited. No, non-accredited currently we don't have. We hope to uh, open that Neil again. George said, non-accredited. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, can I have your machine call my machine? Hoping I can get funds before the opportunity is gone. Anyway, new information that Ken has. So Marcus says, dude, it's cool. You have zero idea how you're helping and opening my mind. That's to AJ. So anyway, everyone, thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure. And uh, we see you next week. Tom Marchesella will report on the, the progress of progressive water, which has been fantastic. And tell us about how crops are 
um, really affected by this because remember, it's a commodities world. Crops is part of it. Thank you all. Have a great night. And uh, you are the best. See you next week. Good night.